Hello everyone, my name is Samantha Laranjo and I will be your moderator for today's webinar on design documentation and how to communicate design intent with your manufacturing partner. I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar and introduce you to our presenters, Amit Ball and Orlin Bates. Amit has been in the PCB industry for over 20 years. He is the Chief Revenue Officer at Sierra Circuits. His passion is to empower tech companies to achieve their visions and change the world. Rockets going into space, self-driving cars taking up the streets, cancer fighting medical devices, protecting the country, he is ready to build any circuit board. Orlin is a senior field applications engineer and has been in the field of PCB design since 1973 and has been with EMA since 2002. Orlin attended vocational tech school, earning a degree in drafting and design technologies. With years of PCB, printed wire design, DFM knowledge, and high volume manufacturing, Orlin is a highly skilled professional in the field of engineering physical design. Amit will start off the webinar with information on today's topic. Assuming we have time at the end, we will field some questions in a formal Q&A. Thank you for your attention, and now over to you, Amit. Okay, great. So I'm super excited to uh, be a part of this webinar today. I think there's a lot of good learnings that we have ready for the audience. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go through uh, the basics and Orlin's going to go into the tool itself and also uh, provide some insights there. So very, very excited uh, to have everyone here. Uh, you know, just as a high level, uh, documentation is uh, the basics, but it's not easy either. Um, sometimes it takes a few iterations to get the documentation correct. Um, especially in prototype phase. So we have uh, customers sending us requirements, um, both in fabrication drawings and assembly drawings and in emails. Um, so I highly discourage email uh, because it's then dependent on your account manager to relay that to manufacturing. You should always try and have everything in, in your uh, fabrication notes and assembly drawings and last resort you can have a readme file that goes through basics and also can give the any sort of special instructions that you don't necessarily want to put on your fab print so a readme file is always really good this is the table of contents for today um, again ask questions we'll be fielding um, you know, those questions and providing answers. Uh, I enjoy the questions that helps me also refine our presentations and also learn from you guys. Uh, so please ask difficult questions as well as the easy ones. So one, one slide about CR circuits. Uh, we're really trying to round out our services to design engineers. So uh, if you look at this, uh, we have engineering tools. Um, these are free on our, on our website, impedance calculators, material selectors, um, and uh, stack up a newly released stack up tool as well. Uh, so, and then uh, we also provide component sourcing services since this is such a big pain in the industry right now, and uh, DFA, DFM, DFT. Uh, services as well. So these are all value add services on top of our uh, fabrication and assembly capabilities. So if you've not used us before in the past, please take a look. We're a very capable uh, provider. So basically the PCB documentation ensures your successful manufacturing iteration uh, without basic questions back and forth and without any miscommunication in terms of manufacturing. So it's a very key step in your design layout process uh, to get the notes correct. And the worst, the worst thing that any fabricator has to deal with is the designer doesn't understand the notes that are on the drawing and that could lead to mistakes as well as 
the fabricator, um, you know, building something that, or having constraints that aren't really necessary, just making it much more difficult for the fabricator. So every, today, in today's time, still, every note is read by a human and a process decision is made based on those notes. So that's how important notes are. Okay, so enough of that uh, speech. Um, you know, basic things that uh, need to be on drawings are dimensions, any sort of uh, overall dimensions, as well as intricate dimensioning that's required, um, you know, any sort of, you know, detail in the drawing that you want to really blow up and show us what you what you mean. Um, all that Orlin can demo at, towards the end of the webinar. And, you know, in terms of the complete kind of packaging, we do need, um, you know, bomb component XY data or placement file, assembly drawings, um, and the actual data itself. So without that, we can't really proceed forward. This is what uh, fabrication drawing the basics look like. Uh, again, if you don't want a full fabrication drawing or uh, you feel the need to not include your fabrication drawing, make sure you include a README which has the basics, which is layer order, um, material types, uh, if there's any impedance on the board, uh, if there's, you know, what is the surface finish that you would like, um, the solder mask color, if there's supposed to be uh, the silkscreen color, and if there's silkscreen on both sides. Uh, so, for example, if you say on your fab note that there should be silkscreen on both sides, and but the data that we get in your Gerber doesn't have two silkscreen layers, that gives the fabricator an opportunity to question and double check the documentation and the design package and come back with a, with a question. So that's the reason to have a README or a full fabrication drawing uh, to set yourself up for success. Again, just uh, general motherhood and apple pie, but important. Uh, of what should go into the fabrication drawing. And the most important thing is the IPC spec of what your board needs to, uh, what requirements your board needs to meet. So most people use the 6012 class two versus class three. And a class three is has more requirements that make the manufacturing of the board, could make the manufacturing of the board more difficult. So only specify class three if you actually need class three. Uh, so if this is again a copy paste of fab notes um, from a class three to a board that really only needs to be class two, um, you're doing more harm than good, um, you know, in relaying that information to your fabricator. Here's the stack of information. Uh, you know, most designers these days will interface with the fabricator and and get the stack up from the fabricator. So I think, um, you know, that's good. You can include that in your package. Uh, I think that's the right way to do it. Um, I think that, uh, you know, don't put in control dielectric unless you actually need control dielectric. And another note on your stack up, if you say your solder mask must be a minimum, let's say of one mil, then us as fabricators, a good fabricator will try and beat the one mil requirement, which means that uh, we might have to do two coats of solder mask, which inadvertently uh, you might be paying for, or it would take more time in process steps. So be careful of what you put in your stack up as the minimum requirements. Now, 062 plus or minus 10% is standard. Um, you know, one comment on the outer layer is that you start with a copper foil and then you plate on the surface and in the via at the same time. 
So the outer layer, really, the finished copper weight on the outer layer is determined primarily by the, um, the plating in the via. So my advice is to leave the outer layer copper requirement um, in a range. So, you know, maybe say one to two ounces is okay for outer layer. And that way we can ensure we're getting enough copper in the via, which is very important for reliability, as well as we're not constrained by the amount, the, the upper copper weight. Okay. We also have our newly introduced stack, stack up design tool. And so it's really just a uh, database of stack ups that you can use uh, at your convenience. Um, we are just about to release uh, IPC 2581 output, which makes it very easy uh, to import into your design tool, uh, you know, so that you don't have to go through the manual steps of uh, inputting your stack up in your um, in your design tool. So I, we're very excited about that. Um, so definitely check out our stack up tool. So for controlled impedance, uh, you know, how do you properly specify controlled impedance on your drawing? So on the right, you have, you know, what it kind of, what it should look like uh, in your in your drawing. So sometimes the uh, the impedance requirement you're trying to achieve um, requires the fabricator to edit traces and spaces. Uh, so you know you should request you know any edits to the impedance lines get approved by you as a designer, um, so that you know what you know what changes are being being made to those critical uh, critical nets. Oh, sorry, one, one other comment on the fabrication drawing is that you can say that you would like a cross section that with the measurements of these uh, critical traces, uh, if, you're, if you have that very specific uh, requirement. Most, most of the time, if you specify control impedance, yeah, the fabricator will Put those coupons on the board and measure the coupons and send you a report of the coupons but if you have an even more let's say special requirement or you want to really tightly control those impedance lines you can ask for a cross section and measurement of those traces specifically so you just put that on your fab drawing and then the fabricator would do that for you We also have an impedance calculator, which uh, it's the same as what's on the market, uh, but it's free and it uses uh, Maxwell's equations. So literally just as good as the very expensive seats. Um, and the, the, the main, uh, it has additional information like propagation delay uh, per unit length. So there are some extra information that you get um, in this tool that aren't available in other tools. So I highly encourage you to try our impedance tool, which is free. Surface finish and the plating uh, is important. So it's an important note to have on your drawing and to understand you know, what, you're, what you're specifying. So here's a little uh, cheat sheet as to what surface finishes are good for what processes. Now, I know hassle is not a cost adder um, or lead free hassle, but if you have any tight pitch components, it's to um, the, the surface roughness um, of hassle is not good for high pitch uh, devices. So I would stay away from hassle and lead free hassle, and I would go with immersion gold. Um, as the as the default. Now, when you specify immersion gold or any pig, even you can use IPC requirements for for the gold and the fabricator. On your fab notes, you should specify that you would like um, a certificate of compliance that measures 
uh, the thickness of the gold. For drilling specifications, uh, this is what your drill chart should look like. Um, you know, one comment I didn't make on the impedance traces, it makes it easier for the cam operator to find your impedance traces if you will modify your impedance traces to be slightly different from the rest of the traces uh, in terms of width from the rest of the traces on the board. And same with uh, holes, hole sizes that, let's say, need to be filled uh, with a non-conductive epoxy. If you can make your drill sizes slightly different, it's easier to find uh, on the, for the cam operator. The other item for, uh, that I want to point out is the drill tolerance. Usually standard is plus or minus three, uh, but if you can make the tolerance um, plus zero minus uh, six, let's say, uh, it allows the fabricator to drill with a larger annular ring, uh, which is good for class three and uh, even class, meeting class two um, requirements. Here's some uh, notes on outer layer, uh, basic etching tolerances. Um, solder mask and silk screen, uh, again, it's just really about uh, do you have, is your, is your intent, is the data there for your intent? If you want silk screen on both sides, if you want solder mask on both sides, what is the color of your solder mask? I'm gonna, this is counter sink, counter borers. I'm gonna breeze through this since you'll have your, you'll have the uh, information in a slide. I think V and pad is uh, critical um, to state that whether it's a conductive epoxy fill or a non-conductive epoxy fill, or even a resin fill is okay on an inner layer sub. So those are what I would state on your fabrication drawing for uh, VN pads. For gold fingers, uh, it's important to have a layer in your data package that outlines where you would like hard gold, which is basically on your fingers, and where would you want Enig, which is basically um, where the solder mask openings are. And so here, um, you can also have notes for uh, chamfering the edges of your uh, gold fingers. Um, here's controlled dielectric kind of requirements. Uh, you know, controlled dielectric can be tricky because in order for us to hit the material thickness, we're picking different glass styles. And so you need to kind of know that, hey, is the thickness you're requesting between layers possible with the glass styles that are existing on the market? And, you know, if the, um, if the dielectric is really that important, um, you know, talk to your fabricator and make sure that they can achieve that uh, final press out thickness. If you're doing controlled dielectric as a way to get around the costs for controlled impedance, uh, just know you're jeopardizing actually your controlled impedance results because we're not, if we over etch but within um, IPC tolerance, you might not get the impedance you're looking for. Um, then we kind of go, I'm going to switch gears and go towards the assembly side of things. So assembly drawings are also equally import, as important. Uh, one comment at the end of your build, especially if it's a prototype run, request a meeting through your account manager to understand where there any fallout or any bad yield that where you can be more clear on your drawings as to any special instructions. Uh, so that you could then add to your assembly drawing. I think that's something that would be very beneficial to both the assembly fabricator as well as you, the customer, to get what you're uh, looking for. Uh, and then the rest is motherhood and apple pie. What does your bomb look like? 
Um, we have a checklist. We'll send it over after this webinar. Uh, if you're technical in nature, this will make a lot of sense to you um, as to what to include in your package and what to put uh, into your uh, final drawing. Now, 2581 is a, is a format that keeps improving. So I highly recommend that you evaluate 2581 as an output. Uh, as that you can standardize on. Uh, ODB uh, is, has been around, but um, is not an open standard uh, as IPC 2581 is. Uh, one quick comment on your net list. If you have any known opens or shorts, intentional, let's say, opens or shorts on your net list, please mention those in your readme file. Um, if you want a design for test assessment, uh, meaning, can our flying probes, you know, what's the coverage of our flying probe test? You can request that. And then we have a plethora of resources for you, all very technical in nature, which I highly recommend. So that's it for me. I'd like to pass it over to Orlin. There we go. I brought this board up. I've got two different boards up save us some time here because I got a lot of material I do want to cover on here but this is a, a basic uh, what I would call manual uh, drafting so the board design's done now I need to get my documentation together and first up would be my fab drawing uh, you heard about the notes it's very important those notes are uh, I I want to emphasize that class one class two class three product that you heard about you really need to know what product you're designing. And those classes, in case you don't know, a class one product is a product you would buy, something goes wrong with it, and nine times out of 10, it just gets thrown in the trash, it goes to a landfill. A class two product's expensive. You're not gonna just throw that away and replace it. You wanna get it fixed, get it repaired. Uh, so that's a class two product. Class three product is the highest level product that you could design and if you have a failure in a class three product the best you can hope for is to send body bags home to the families and the most recent class three product failure that made the news was boeing's max eight was a class three product failure they did not have body bags to send home so right up front you need to know what you're designing it starts right with the pad stack the drill the pad ratio all that is is just the fundamental part of a class three product that you need to design in there those fab notes gives the manufacturer direction on what you're doing uh, those notes need to be reviewed uh, you can have them as a symbol in our software and just place them as a symbol but that leads people to want to just ignore them and not review them these notes here instead of a symbol i have them as a line item so i could go in there and identify each one grab each one as a different light item so i could go in there and and literally if i wanted to come in and edit or move it i could grab that and literally just grab that and show you that it's just a line item that i've added in there but something i've went over and reviewed closely before i would ever send that off the other thing in here is our tool will give you up under the manufacturing, uh, it's going to give you uh, dimension environment. And I say environment because it's you're not just putting dimensions down there. These dimensions are intelligent. I'm dimensioning to the edges of the board. I'm dimensioning to this tooling hole, meaning if I change that tooling hole and move it, the dimensions will automatically update for me and let me know the new dimensions that I've just changed this to or I re reduce the board size. Those dimensions are already going to update for me. I don't have to go in there and update those. But I also make an artwork of the outline. And what you see here is this outline and these cutouts in there. And the reason I do that is in my fab notes, I'll say the dimensions are reference. That artwork's accurate. So if they need to know exactly where those cutouts are, and I didn't dimension properly, my board's gonna be put on hold, and that's the last thing I want, because they're not gonna go forward and, and create junk for you. So if there's a discrepancy, 
and they have no other way to solve that discrepancy, it's going to be put on hold and it'll come back to you with these questions. So I go ahead and create a Gerber file and I'll come up here and just go ahead and open that up. And I just call it cutouts and that's going to be the Gerber file again with those slots that I need cut out there. That That's important. Uh, I'll go ahead and show that I can also go in and dimension all of these, which I have, and details of what they are so they know each one of those little slots in there. The reason the slots are even there in this design, and it seems like there's a lot of them, is that we had high voltage creeping across the FR4 material. Now the option is go to a better material, but that cost kind of threw the customer into where the product wouldn't be cost competitive. They needed FR4. So we go in there and make these moats, literally cut slots in the board to stop that high voltage creepage from going across. But here I am documenting it in detail. But at the same time, if any of these details are wrong, follow that Gerber file because it is accurate and it's what I want in there. Now, because ours is a dimension such that it's what I call intelligent dimensions, if I move that slot, the dimension changes also. So I'm, I'm pretty sure 99.9% .9 that my dimensions are correct, but I still want that safety net to say, okay, come on back, and, and if I made a mistake, follow the Gerber files, or check my dimensions, and they should match the Gerber files exactly, and you shouldn't have any issues there. Again, I'm doing this drafting 101. I'm in here doing my dimensioning. I'm creating these files. Now let's go back here to our uh, number one. I can come up here on my fab drawing number one, and I can come in here now, and I can create a drill table, which you see off to the right. Important thing about this, those last minute changes, we all seem to have them ready to go out the door. Usually it was a, a Friday night and I'm ready to go home and a change comes in and yet I still want to get this to that fabricator for a Saturday run. I need to redo this chart. It does not update automatically. So I have to regen this chart manually. And sometimes that people forget that. And then I need to go in there and create uh, my cross-section chart. So I know the cross-section of the materials and it gives you a whole list. The software is doing this. But what's important about that is the software is doing that only if you're going to have the stack up correct. So we jump here into the stack up and I wanna make sure that I'm literally putting the correct material on here. And then uh, this is the information that is actually passed over to our manufacturer on there. The nice thing about the software is I can export it out. And what I'm saying is if I develop this, I want to send it over to that fabricator. So that first question was, how soon do you get in touch? I get in touch immediate with them. It's basically if there's high speed nets, high density areas, I'm using micro vias. I want to get with that manufacturer right up front. I want to get a stack up from them. And if I get a stack up from them, I don't want to come in here and do all this work. I'll just come in here and say, import in my IPC 2581 or a technology file. I'll load that in. I don't have to come in here and set this up. It's already set up. They've done the work, so why duplicate that and make a mistake? I'll just grab their information and bring it forward in there. So let's go ahead and just cancel out this. So that's where I'm in there. This is actually doing this again manually. And then I'll jump to my assembly drawing. I need to create assembly drawing. I create the assembly drawing on the top side for the top. And in the bottom side, how I can do that is I come up to manufacturing, go into that drafting mode, and I'm just going to create a detail. And I can scale that up and down. So if I got room, in this case, a C-size drawing, I got room, I can put both assembly uh, views on the same sheet. It's a C-size, so if I plot it two to one, it's actually going to be a D-size, very readable. But most PDFs now, you can just zoom into them now and read them. Uh, but again, the, back in the old days, we'd create paper documentation that would be uh, created and put into document control because this is a product that's being released. Uh, if it's a military, it better match what comes in that back door. Your documentation must match that or they reject that. So if you've got your documentation not correct and it's coming in the back door the way you want it, it's still not going to be received because it isn't matching. 
and that goes for your layer stack up also in there. So we're going to shift gears now. I'm going to close that down, and here's a, a rigid flex board that we've got. And in the rigid flex board here, uh, just same with the other board, but I want to go back into the constraint manager here. And in the constraint manager, what we've done is we've come in here. Uh, we've got it set up to where you can, under the wiring selection, you can go in there and you can tell it what layer sets you want your routes to be on. The constraint manager in our system, I call the brains of the operation. If you get it correct, that design is going to be true to that design because the constraint manager is going to make you design it correctly. It's going to give you errors. If you do not, you'll get DRCs that are in what we call butterflies. Some of them are just in lines of unparallelism, those diff pairs. But in most cases, you'll get this butterfly, and it has two letters in there. And those letters will tell you what type of error. If you set up a layer set, whether you use our auto router or whether you go in there manually start routing, the software is going to force you onto that layer that those nets belong. So I'm guaranteed that even if I'm tired and it's been a 12 hour day, I'm not going to make a mistake because the software is constantly looking after me. Uh, relative propagation delay. Uh, again, your clocks, your strobes, and your data lines in that DDRX, whatever you're doing, they're relative to each other. They're different nets. Yes, clock nets are different than the strobes and different than address lines, but they're relative to each other. They got to be there. Flight time is important. And what's important in the differential pair is that ground return. It has been proven over and over again. You need a return ground via out there at the end of those differential pairs. Uh, to cut down on that noise, we'll, we'll talk some more about that a little later. Now I want to jump down into what's manufacturing. So this is where I think we've made some great strides here in the manufacturing. I used to be an AE. Uh, EMA used to sell Valor before Mentor bought it. And then there was a reason we couldn't sell Valor anymore, but I was the application engineer for Valor. Prior to that in my uh, career life, I used Valor all the time. This is what we want to do. We want to bring those type of checks right up front. So we're going to come in here and we're going to set up your board manufacturer so that we have the rules from that manufacturer. Now, these rules aren't current. It's been a, quite a while. I've been with EMA for 20 years, so it's been quite a while since I've actually sent boards out to a fabricator. Uh, so these, you know, are frozen in time, and that time is, is a good many years ago. So ignore the values. Just understand that these values you will receive from your fabricator. They'll give you these values. You put those in here. Now what are you doing? You're not waiting at the end to do a process to check to make sure you're meeting their qualifications. They're going to run it through a valor checker. You're going to run it through a valor check, and it's going to flag all these problems. Now you got to go back to your design and start redesigning it so that that fabricator can build your product. This is allowing you to have those rules right up front. Right at the start, you're going to design it correct. It's true to the design because the software is going to make you follow these rules. So I go in here, and I put all their rules in there, mask, annular ring. Remember, annular ring has everything to do with that class one, class two, class three product. There's with the basics, there's where we start with it. Then I can jump down here on my design and click on it. And now I decide who I'm going to have actually do my fabrication on there. So I can go in there, select that. Now I'm checking my physical design that I just finished to this fabricator's rules. So I know when I send it out, I'm perfect. I'm right on target with what I need. Well, we've also set that up for the assembly. So we go into the assembly on here. We're going to set up. Uh, I show my prejudice there with Jabel Circuits because I was CAD manager up there. But I'm telling you, the reason I know what I know is because of the different places I've been, the different places I worked. When I was at Jabel Circuit, I come down, as, as the workers would say, out of my ivory tower on the second floor, and I was out there on the floor with them. And these are some of the valuable things they taught me. Uh, you have to have a pick place machine, and you might need two of them because you've got a large board with a lot of parts where there's so many real parts, parts that are coming on a reel that you're loading these pick place machines with. If you've got 
one capacitor that the other ones are on the back side and you put that one on the top, you have to have a whole reel of parts on that pick place machine just for, to place that one part. And a little bit of design and possibly not even negligence to the fact that that caps on the back side versus the top side, you can save throughput on there. The board we were working on there, we were running 60,000 boards a shift on there and ran two shifts for that customer. That throughput was very important on there. The other thing that these assembly houses need is, is that stencil. They need to make a stencil for your paste. Uh, all that information needs to come out of your system. Those are tools that you need to pass on to them so that they can process those. Then I called it the dishwasher. There's a wash cycle that they send the boards through. What if the part's a microphone? What if the part's a battery? Obviously, you don't want to put that battery on there and then send it through the wash cycle. So there's going to be maybe some assembly after the wash cycle that needs to be done that's too sensitive to run through that dishwasher. High temps, water splashing everywhere, cleaning them up. Uh, that's very important to know that. So that information needs to be sent to that uh, assembly house. If you're, you're lucky and it's the fab house and the assembly house all in one, you're sending just that one file. We talked about the IPC 2581 on there. So here's, here's your chance to design to that vendor. Uh, we also supply your ability to have tests. I don't have any test fixture people in there yet but we have that ability to go with our test. Now, the important thing that I also realized at Jable, it's so dense, we want a certain amount of testing. So we created a clamshell. That's a very expensive test, but it was easier to make a bottom bed and nails tester and a top bed and nails tester. It was cheaper to do that. We got better coverage than to, to create a, a clamshell. So that board would come off, we could, probe the top, flip the board over, probe the bottom on the next tester, and we got better coverage at a cheaper price. Now you gotta know what type of probe you're gonna use. Are you gonna use a crown head or are you gonna use a spear? Crown head needs a larger pad, spear needs a smaller pad. Everyone loves the spear, I did in my days, because I can get more tests in there. A uh, smaller pad gives me a chance to get more room in there. Problem is that spear will wear out four times faster than that crown head. So they're constantly maybe reworking that spear in that test fixture. I mean, 60,000 of boards in one shift is a lot of boards that go through a test fixture. So they really would prefer that crown head for more durability on there. All this stuff you can do design right up front. So as I close this down, what we've set up here, I'm going to go ahead and change this. I could just jump here and talk about it too, but I can go ahead and change this to just manufacturing. Now, everything in here, we are letting you know what you need to do to prepare for that manufacturing, right down to the outputs. So if we've got the outputs already defined for you, you come in here, now there's no more question, what do I need to send? These are the files you need to send and we put them out here, and I can literally just click on them, and up comes my IPC 2581. Now I can come in here, and I can decide what release I want of that, the, the, what I call the beta release, release one, or A, B, and now C's out. I usually will take B if I have to separate my assembly from my fabrication. If not, I'm gonna go C, and I'm just gonna grab everything, you're going to get the entire design. I can break it up or I can get the entire design that I want in there. It gives you your uh, bill of material, your BOM, your AVL, that approved vendors list that you've got. All that information is tied in there and passed on to the vendor of your choice. That's the important thing. The other thing I wanna say about the IPC 2581 is I heard the, the words used to describe that. I, I am a little more direct. Uh, ODB++ is proprietary. Proprietary means at any time they can start charging. Now Siemens bought Mentor and they haven't started charging for that, but they could. So the IPC council decided it is best for the customer not to be held hostage. Hostage is saying I got paid to get my data out. So IPC come up with this 2581. 
basically to mimic ODB++. When that council was formed, the thing that impressed me most about that council was it was made up mostly with the high-end level engineers that actually worked on ODB++. So you have the confidence that IPC has done it correctly, has got the original people from the ODB++, and they've developed this and took it yet further than ODB++ has. I mean, that's kind of dying on the vine, and IPC25 is going forward, giving more information to you, more flexibility. I want to come in here and do a label, label mapping on here. So I need to come in here and decide and let the board vendor and the assembly house know what's what. Uh, obviously, bottom is probably my outer layers. CRT is that miscellaneous fab layer. That's my board outline or my uh, cutouts is my board outline. This default view is something that's mine. So I would just check that out and not even send that file because that's a default view I'm using as I was designing the product. And it's going to output all these files on here. So I'll go ahead and cancel out of there. And let me go ahead and close this down. I would do want to jump in to uh, the stack up again, just to show you that in the tool, I can just look at the primary. Now, here's my stack up for my primary board. I can go in there and look at my flex one. There's a stack up for that. And my uh, flex two, and in my LCD stiffener, that's uh, another flex that's on this particular design. Or I can look at them all together. The other thing I want to go ahead and slide over here, and let's just jump in the primary, and I want to come over here to my signal integrity. Double click on that. Let me scoot over here. So in here, I want to come in here, and I'm now concerned about my diff pairs. I want to come in here, and I want to do edge to edge. I don't want to do broadside. We support that. Some people do, but I'm not one to use broadside. And the reason I'm not, look over there on the left where it says top and ground. That's a core material. That is purchased. That's material that the board fabricator is purchasing. They're not making that. They're purchasing that. Some of the ones out there is Roger, G-Tech. Those type of manufacturers are creating these panels. They're in control of that dielectric constant in between there that that thickness isn't accurate or that thickness varies a little broadside's not going to give you quite the impedance you were expecting when you're running those differential pairs edge to edge you're on the same layer side by side you've got better control over that and your fabricator does too in their process notice between now ground and inner one there's where i can build up my material but again as i caution i would never just create this and send it first blindly to the board house. I would be interfacing with that board house right up front. Can you build what I've got? Is the materials I'm asking for Rogers or G-Tech available for you? Yeah, G-Tech's a little more expensive, but and this is a joke, you guys, but they send me a pension check every month, so that's probably why they're more expensive. But uh, you need to know what your material is, the type of material, and that board house is there to help you. They can, as I said, go ahead and send it to you. You can import it in, and I can just import that in, and I don't have to do all this lost tangent. They've already figured that out for me and sent that file to me. So that's what's important. The other thing I want to point out in our tool here, if I'm going edge to edge, if I come in here and change this value, if I don't want that 7.87 in there, and I go down to a 6.5 on there, hit return, notice my impedance just changed to 97 on there. I can click on here and I can change line width instead of spacing if I want to decide or come up here and just say, well, I want 100 ohms impedance is what I want on there. And it gives me 99.815, that's within tolerance. Notice my, my spacing changed to 7.16 to give me that impedance I was wanting cadence and bless their hearts they did not develop this themselves polar calculator has been around forever most board houses use polar as their impedance calculator all they did is license it to run in our tool and i hats off to them for that i think that was the best thing they could have done let me go ahead and just close out of this all right 
So now I want to go ahead and shift gears. There's the manual. There's doing all the hard work. Uh, now we're going to come over here under manufacturing, and I'm just going to go to what we call the documentation editor. And it's going to spawn up this documentation editor. It's going to take a few minutes. And now I'm in the tool. The first thing you'll see that once I'm in this tool is we have the tutorials built right in. So it's been a while since you've been here. You can go ahead and look and see what the documentation editor has available. Uh, you can refresh yourself on how to use it for that matter. Uh, then we have the panel editors also out there, and there's a DFM checker that's out there. DFM checker's kind of going away because of the fact that we let you get the board vendors rules, right? I don't care to check these now. I got the board vendor rules. I'm checking to that. That's more important. I come in here and I say create new and then it's going to go ahead I've already done this demo a number of times so I got to erase the old data out there I say okay to get rid of that data out there now notice that these highlighted up I've got licenses to run all this I can jump right into the documentation editor and start doing some manual stuff but now they've come out with this new wizard I'm come up here and I want a fab drawing I want an assembly drawing let's not make a panel drawing when we go high volume manufacturing, they're going to do that. Uh, I could create one. I could uh, back in our CAD system. I could create a panel, and if it's prototype boards, I could put if the same stack up. Of course, I could put multiple boards on there. They're going to charge you for a whole panel anyway, so take advantage of it. Put multiple boards on there if they're prototypes, and get as many prototypes as you can. This is for fabrication. I'm going to let them do the panel on them high volumes. I want my sheet border. I want my title, and I need a revision block on there. If it was page two, I'd put the continuation. I'm not going to have a page two, at least I hope not. Again, I'm doing C size drawings on here. Plot them out two to one. There'll be a D size. Now in the fabrication sheet, I just want one. I want the drill pattern. I want the drill chart. I want that layer stack up and I need them fab notes. This is all these things we've just been harping and harping on that the board house needs. So I say next. Now I'm at the assembly level. I want the top view. I want the bottom view in there. I want to be one sheet on this assembly drawing if I can. Now in the old days, and I'm showing my age here, uh, we used to put parts list on there, but we used to use the Leroy lettering to to draw all those in there and unless you use bishop graphics and did inking you don't know the pain that we went through and how blessed we were to get CAD systems in here so I don't want my parts list put out into the drawing itself it's going to be a separate a size bill of material that we send all over but I do want my assembly notes in there and I can go ahead and and hit the finished on there now, what it's doing is it's bringing that IPC 2581 database in there. It's reading that, and it's literally creating those drawings for me in a matter of seconds. The nice thing about that is this is really geared for maybe engineers who don't do drafting at all, who never had drafting at all in school. This will give you a consistent fab and assembly drawing within your organization because everyone's is going to look the same and be the same. Yes, you need to change these notes if these notes aren't it, what you need. Uh, preferably, you've already went in. Once you had this tool, you've got your gallery and you set up your own symbols within your organization that's going to be brought in. Uh, and then I could go in there and I could select my organization and I could go in there and I could do these engine exploded views on there so i've got my fab drawing here and then i can scroll down and there's my assembly drawing notice the software has done all this for me there's my assembly notes and it did put the top assembly i might need to change this note and pull it up out of the border there but i've already got that you create your border all these common areas so if I wanted to do it manually, as I was telling you, instead of having the wizard do it, I'd pull that sheet in, I'd pull that title block in. If it's page two, I have a continuation block, obviously, on that. So then I could come in in a fab and I could start doing other things in the fab drawing that I didn't necessarily do up front. I could do a custom view. It has the layer stack up. I don't have a via stack up, I could do that. If I got back drilling, the software knows back drilling, 
and I could put my back drill in there. I call back drill the cheap uh, blind and buried VM. It is cheaper if I could go all the way through the board uh, with a VIA and then go knock that antenna out of there from a high speed by back drilling and knocking it out. The important thing about back drilling is you gotta remember they're gonna knock that pad out. So you're gonna drill a little larger than that pad to knock it out. Now that becomes a clearance issue. If your software is not set up to, to know that you're going to back drill, flag that hole as a back drill, then it's not going to DRC you that you've got to trace too close. Literally, you could be close enough to where you could sever that in your back drilling process. So that's important to keep on, especially if your tool's not going to let you know about that back drill uh, distance that you need to keep. We were talking about fingers and gold plating, so we could do a detail on fingers in the fab also. If I did a panel drawing, then I could come in there and I could put my mouse bites in there or my scoring in there. Of course, we're not going to be talking about that. We weren't doing a panel on this one. Now I can go to my assembly. I can do an exploded view of my assembly. I can do a cross section if I want. That parts list, if I put it on here, and I wouldn't, but if I put it on there, I could go in there and have my parts list and I can go in there and start editing that. A variance list. So I got one bare board, but it's how they populate it to that variance list would, could create three, four different, uh, different assemblies for me from that one raw card. Uh, so that's our variance list. And then we could have multiple variances lists in there instead of just one, I could have you know, that two or three or four I was talking about. And then that variance legend that we would talk about so we'd know where the product's done. Uh, the, most recent variance I did was on site up in Detroit. Uh, they told me I could use their name. They were, I think, proud to get their name out there. But I was up there and they were doing a, a one card assembly for temperature control. And they were trying to make it fit that new electric Mustang and they wanted to keep a temperature on them electric motors. So now we weren't just doing temperatures for uh, a radiator. We weren't doing temperatures for the transmission as much as we were concerned about those electric motors and overheating and the battery itself of overheating. So that variance list, we want to keep that same raw card, but make it available for all those in there. And then we have uh, our uh, component charts. So given them the, the actual ref des of that and the XY location of those, you could have that on your assembly drawing. Your assembly drawing, of course, would grow in size. Here's our process step. So in that process step, the last time I used it, it was really to help a customer with uh, conductive ink that they were doing. The assembly's done, right? Now they're coming back and putting some conductive ink on there. But this process step could be those microphones that come later or that battery that you didn't want to put into the wash cycle. You're giving them a process step on how this gets assembled. Uh, if you don't do that, you know, it isn't the fault of the fabricator. They're building what you want and they're following your instructions. So the important thing is to have the correct instructions out there to get it built correctly. Know your product and know what you need to do with that product is, is very important on there. So we have the, uh, the fab drawing and we have the assembly drawing. Uh, there's a number of things this tool will do. So now, right now we're in home. I could create a new drawing. I go in there and I could set up what text I want and how I want it to look, the size and everything like that. I've got a number of different, I can go in and search for things. I can go in and fit the sheet so I can view that. I come over here under insert. Now I could do a custom view. I can bring a table in. I can bring pictures in. I can go ahead and bring in a DXF from AutoCAD or anyone else who creates a DXF actually. I can bring in my Adobe PDF. I can bring in the Gerber files. I have other files I can bring in. I can add notes at any time, anywhere along the design. If I go into drawing mode, I'm in basic drafting now. Here's where I'm doing my drawings. If I want to do a detail of something else and I literally want to do drafting 101 and start drafting, uh, I can come in and do my dimensioning. The, this, the tool helps. It's a lot like uh, in our host system where it's an environment type uh, where you're going in there doing that. Under the documentation here, this is where I can delete some sheets. I can duplicate a sheet if I want, rename it, resize it, whatever I need to do on there. Under the tools here, here's where I have my fabrication manager, my data manager. I'm basically putting information out there for my fabricator to know. 
I can go out there again with my coordinate list, my uh, PDF, I'm exporting those out. And then I can come over to my view file and I can go ahead and I can look at my grid, my ruler. I can go in there and measure stuff. I can, you know, it's basically a uh, drafting. Um, and that's what we're calling it, really. We're in here doing drafting. We're making documentation and that's what dra drafting is all about in there. I want to go ahead as we close out. I've got another gallery here and I did want to show you uh, my ride home in the, the picture that I put out here. So let me grab that and get it back up in here. So you can literally take a picture of the board if you want and have a, a nice graphic picture of the board let you put in there and it can be part of your documentation. I've known some who put a hot link in there to go back to uh, their main page of their company. So in the title block or above the title block, you could actually click on that. Most cases above the title block, there's where I would put my ITAR uh, label that I have out there, warning that this is an ITAR design and how to handle that ITAR if you're if you understand that, been through that type of training. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Samantha. I'm, I'm finished, ready for questions. Yes, thank you, Orlin. So at this time, I would like to open the floor for the Q&A. Please enter any questions you have in the chat now. Just a reminder to all attendees that this webinar will be recorded and posted on the EMA website within the next few days. First question I have is, does Sierra Circuits also support high volume manufacturing? Uh, yes, we actually, that's a new service that we're providing. So our main business for the last 30 years has been prototyping, but we are also now providing high volume manufacturing. Is it better to try and panelize a design myself or leave it to the CM? Unless you've used a panelization, uh, it would probably be better for you to leave it for your fabricator to do. Uh, it, it takes a little talent and a little understanding. If you can remember on that design, I had slots cut in the bottom. So if I was gonna panelize that with those slots in the bottom, I would wanna rotate that such that those slots were always on the outside edge of that panel. So I would have it drop to the bottom and then rotate it, spin it around so that the slots were at the top. Uh, that's that routing out feature because you couldn't do a very good job with uh, mice bites and you sure can't score something like that. So you know, that type of thing comes in. The uh, last thing you want to do is waste time sending them a panel that they can't use. So if you're not really comfortable with that, definitely go ahead and, and pay whatever tooling charge it is and have them do it for you. Um, another question we have um, asked, please comment on the preferred method for ro rotating artwork on a panel. Yeah, so in, within our tool, we have that uh, ability and like I said in the panelization of our tool it allows you to go in there and rotate that and panelize that so you're literally rotating it uh, the important thing if you don't have that feature in your tool literally you're you've got to make sure that you pick up everything basically you're rotating your design really because if you're rotating that you're rotating your pads you're rotating your drills all that information has to be rotated and it can get tricky if the tool isn't there to help you do that now. For IP protection, I do not include schematics with fab packages. Why might a CM need this? Um, if you're doing flying probe test at assembly or any testing, it's good to, um, you know, it's important to be able to debug at that stage. Um, IPC 2581 or ODB also comes with the netlist. Um, schematic, so you don't need uh, a schematic at PCB manufacturing ever. Um, at assembly, you could you need the schematic to debug. Somebody asked, I don't use IPC 2581, is it free? 
Yes, it is. Uh, that's one of the reasons the IPC Council formed themselves, that no customer would ever be held hostage getting their data out. ODB++ is proprietary software. They don't charge at this point, but uh, they can in the future charge, and then you're held hostage getting your data out. IPC Council decided that no one should be held hostage to getting their data out of the software, and that's why the Council got together and created the, the IPC 2581. No different than uh, when you used to output the IPC uh, netlist for that golden board check in the old days. It's, it's no different. It'll always be free. Is it required to put cleaning spec on assembly drawing? Yes. All right. Thank you again, Amit and Orlin. Unfortunately, we are out of time for today. However, if anyone has questions that were not addressed during the webinar, we will be following up with you on an individual basis. I will be closing the webinar now, and we will be sending everyone a recorded version of today's webinar with a slide deck within the next few days. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it.